Well, let's pray. Lord, help us in light of Israel and the Jewish people and the place the land has to play in the history of the world and the history of redemption. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome, everybody. Thrilled that you're here. Uh, if just one came, we would enjoy it. But the more, the merrier. Uh, so, looking at what we looked at last week, the first week we looked at the promises made to the fathers. Abraham, Abram, who became Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who became Israel, and then 400 years later, Moses, uh, who wrote the law, and through his writings, we know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the promises to them from Almighty God had, every, had a lot to do with them as a people, but also with their homeland that he was going to give them. And um, now, tonight we're going to review some of what God told Moses. Beside the promise, he gave promises of of the land. There's laws that involve the land, and this is some of them. This is not all all of the laws. So, um, in Leviticus 25, God said there in verse 38, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Here's why. To give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. So he wanted both. I'm going to be your God. That's why I rescued you. So now you got a reason to praise me. And I want you to inhabit this land. And what we're going to see is you can't have the land without having God. Otherwise, he's going to let you lose it. All right. Um, He talks about, let's go ahead and read this passage. This is probably the most important one on this whole paper. Uh, After all this, verse 27 of chapter 26, if you do not obey me but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Verse 32, I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. Why would they be astonished? They conquered this fruitful land, and then it's desolate. What happened? (laughs) Where's the big grapes? (laughs) Verse 34, Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. So during this time of desolation, the land gets to rest because you guys, in your sinning against me, will have never trusted me, will have not trusted me enough to not farm the land for a year. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest, for the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwell on it, dwelt on in it. Verse 40, But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, and that they also have walked contrary to me, verse 42, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham. I will remember, I will remember the land. Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. For their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors. So it all boils down to me, to the friendship he had with Abraham. And he promised to bless Abraham's children. So why are they the chosen people? Because God loved their father and he promised to have the back of their children. In human terms, some people write in their will who they want to take care of their kids. And if they die, and in the event of their death, they agreed to raise that person's kids. Uh, We never had a will during those days, but our children wanted us to and they wanted the Duncans. They wanted Joe and Laura to be the ones to raise them because they didn't want to be raised by relatives. (laughs) (laughs) So Joe's like, thank God you guys lived. (laughs) They raised three great kids. They're great parents. So God promises to remember the covenant if they will repent and turn back to him. So it all goes back to verse 36 of Leviticus 35. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. You cease letting me be your God, then you're going to cease being in that land. And then if you cry, and that, then that land is going to be desolate. And then if you cry out to me, I will 
hear your cry and restore you to the land. The enemies that take the land will be astonished. Now, it's my understanding, part of the reason for the desolation prior to what happened in the 40s was the Turks did some things mm -hmm. to uh, destroy the land as well, tearing up trees and forests and stuff like that. Uh, destruction. Haiti, in their poverty, when the French abandoned them, uh, the French were, out of all the colonialists, I think the French were some of the worst. Because when they left, they just left the people. And so the poor people destroyed their forest to make charcoal to uh, sell, to be able to survive. And so now when a flood comes, all their topsoil goes out to sea. I mean, not all of it, but every year topsoil goes out to sea. There's no, there's no trees to hold it in. Papa Doc, when he was in power, didn't want any trees to be planted because his enemies could hide behind trees. <laughs> so there in our day is a land becoming desolate because of the lack of vegetation and the flooding and the island and the hurricanes and all that. Back to Israel. So this is a key to remember for tonight's lesson is that God says, you know, you guys are out of there if you don't, if you don't rec you know, respect me as God. All right. Numbers, the highlighted portion, verse 2 of chapter 15. When you have come into the land, you are to inhabit which I am giving you. So there's some things that Moses was to say to them when they came into the land. Um, and he spoke to Moses saying, verse 53, to these the land shall be divided as an inheritance according to the number of names. So there is a, a map I have of how the land was divvied up between the tribes. Um, and then the highlighted portion of Numbers 27, see the land which I have given to the children of Israel. So God's reiterating, man, I'm giving you guys this land. This isn't just Abraham's idea. Um, now, he, he says, I'm giving you the land, but then they have to fight for it. Isn't that funny? <laughs> God gives us promises, but we, through faith, we attain those promises, right? So, Numbers 33, he said, You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. I have given you the victory, now go fight. <laughs> God is a faith God, and so we walk by faith and trusting in him. Um, Numbers 34, when you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance, the land of Canaan to its boundaries. And he gives them their boundaries. And we have a map here of the boundaries. And I understand uh, the coinage in Israel, the shekel, has the map of the full promised land. Is that right. true? Does anybody have a shekel on them? If you have one, can you bring it next week so we can see it? But this map is on their coinage. It's of ten Israel. Agarot. Ten Agarot is the coin. Okay. And the Agarot is a tenth of a shekel. So yeah, okay. ten Agarot, it's like a dime is to a so, dollar. And on the so, back of it, you have, see clearly a menorah, but behind the menorah is a raised. And it's like, is this just a bump? that they put the menorah on, no, okay. that's actually the map. The promise. The promise I love it. I love it. Wow. Yeah. I'll yeah. bring one next week. So. Um, so after laying out, after laying out all the oh. unique borders, <laughs> let's pass it around, yeah. There it is. That's really interesting. Yeah, did I have one in my pocket? Well, thank you. <laughs> that is, that's interesting, but but I shut it to my shekel. <laughs> but <laughs> but that they, they would actually oh, commemorate oh. that. Yeah. yeah. That's well, surprising. It's on the floor. Right? Yeah. I thought it went down my pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. That is. Sorry. Really surprised. Yeah. Here we go. Pass it this way. Behind the menorah is a raised relief of the deal. Wow. So Numbers 34, the last sentence there. This shall be your land with its surrounding boundaries. This is the promise. Um, but I think the promise on the coinage is Abraham's boundaries. <laughs> <coughs> that much land would have been too much to take, I think, for the freed slaves, but it was their full promise. What if they had walked in obedience to God and inherited the full promise, that part of the world might be different. I think yeah, it would be. Considerably. <coughs> considerably. All right, Deuteronomy 1, verse 8. 
God says, See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. Deuteronomy 3. You know, Deuteronomy has to do with the number 2 or the word second. It's a review of the law. So we get some review here. Uh, Deuteronomy 3, 18. The Lord has given you this land to possess. In verse 28, he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. So Moses got to see it, but he didn't get to, get to take it. Um, and then in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verse 10, when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Um, and he tells them that they may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. Deuteronomy 8, last part of verse 1, possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. Deuteronomy 11.23, the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you and you will dispossess greater and mightier nations than yourselves. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. And he gives some more boundaries in promises. Uh, Deuteronomy 12 verse 1, in the land which the Lord your God has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. So this is a big promise, but it takes faith. It really does. And I think sometimes our normal human nature just wants to be a slacker. I don't want to fight the fight of faith. I want to go the easy route. I want to, um, you know, fill a can and then sit on it, I guess. All right, chapter 16 of Deuteronomy, verse 20. You shall follow all, you shall follow what is altogether just that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Deuteronomy 26, verse 9. He has brought you to this place and has given you this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, flora and fauna. Deuteronomy 28, the well-known passage full of curses and blessings. Uh, the Lord said he would grant them plenty in the land of which your fa the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. Now, chapter 30 of Deuteronomy is a review of what we began with. Verse 1, Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord drives you, and you return to the Lord your God, and obey his voice according to all I command you today, you and your children with all your heart, and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the last highlighted portion there in that chapter, He is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. So God wanted to be their life, their length of days, and really their source and their home. Make me your home and you'll have a home. If you don't, you won't. <laughs> It is not easy, but we're seeing this promise fulfilled on a grand scale, I think, and on a scale where all the people returning to the land are not necessarily repenting. <laughs> but there's a significant amount of them. How many people does it take to save a city? Ten would have saved Sodom, yeah, right? Yeah, right? So there's a significant amount that are sincere, crying out to God with the faith and understanding that they have. God knows we don't have to have perfect understanding for him to hear our prayers. He hears mine, right? No. Moses messed up. And so he was the first example. Yeah, he saw the land, didn't get to inherit it. Mm -hmm. 
What an example for them to abide by. We better honor the Lord. He didn't honor the Lord in the eyes of the people. He struck the rock. That was Christ. It was... Yeah. Speak to it. <clears throat> so, to me, it all boils down to, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. So, while we've got to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we've got to recognize it's more than just their enemies laying down their arms. It's shalom peace, peace with God. May God show himself to them and bless his people who do our part for it. Mm -hmm. um, so now, part three. Everybody get one of these yet? Yeah, Number three? Right. Okay. So we've looked at the fathers, we've looked at the law, now we're going to look at the possessing of the land. And if we have time, some of this sad promise, warning, being received. So in each case, God's showing himself alive and giving them the land and then taking them away from it. After the death of Moses, who saw the land and didn't inherit it, Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Wow, Nun had a child. I'm sorry, that's bad. <laughs> Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving you, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, that is the Mediterranean, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. This is his promise to Joshua. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. You're not just going to conquer this land. You're going to help divvy it up. <laughs> All right, chapter 21, verse 43 of the book of Joshua. <laughs> so the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he swore he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Was, these were glorious days. All right, chapter 24, Joshua gives the people a charge. He's the one speaking for God. It says, I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, either the gods back home in Egypt or the gods that were worshipped here. Choose it. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. A judge is an interesting book of them not being loyal to the Lord and the Lord allowing their enemies to harass them. And in there is a word from an angel. The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and your God, their God shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. So there was repentance again, but then how soon we forget. 
This is why we need to fight by faith. When you live by faith, you're depending on God. If we have no problems, we are so self-willed, we'll go yep. and live life our way. Yep. Do our thing. Yep. That's, that's how we are. Yep. So we're jumping through history. Judges is an amazing book of enemies harassing them. God raising up a deliverer when the people cry out for help. And he answers, gives them victory, and then they fall away again into unfaithfulness and idolatry and breaking God's heart. And then God, they cry out to God for help, and he raises, it's a cycle, a cycle. Yep. Which, if we have time, we'll look at the prayer prayed by Israel in Nehemiah 9. It reviews this. The cycle is amazing. God showing himself. There's no other people on earth that God deals with like this to show what he's like, who he is. Mm -hmm. I have a thought, and this is something that I try to examine myself. You know, the weeping. I think too many times, I think about the difference in remorse and repentance. Yeah. Repentance is, I'm sorry for the pain I caused you. Yeah. Remorse is, I'm sorry I got caught. And yeah. I think too many times, we have remorse instead of repentance yeah yeah so it's not just tears so, it's repentance it's remorse that brings change mm -hmm. beyond just being sorry um, now we have kind of two parallel passages here you see this often with the Psalms and other passages in the Old Testament first Chronicles 16 which is which is a review of Israel's history kind of like Deuteronomy was a review of the law the Chronicles are a review of Samuel's books and the king's books uh, o seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word which I commanded for a thousand generations. His covenant is inseparable from them. The covenant which I made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Now this covenant is part of the law because it pre-existed the law. It's the foundation of everyone's relationship with God. So we, it's where we are grafted into that promise to Abraham. Saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as an allotment for your inheritance when you were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. So God gave him this promise, this big land when there wasn't very many folks. So in Psalm 105, O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance when they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. So God's a faith God. He makes declarations that the eye, the eyes can't see. Of course, He knows everything too. But. All right, in dedicating the temple. Solomon prays this huge prayer. Oh, that he would have stayed with the wisdom mm -hmm. God had given him. Second mm -hmm. Chronicles six twenty four. Or if your people are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you and return and confess your name and pray and must make supplication before you in this temple, then, he's asking God, hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you gave to them and their fathers. He had no idea that in that process the building would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they've sinned against you, when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land which you have given to your people as an inheritance. When there is famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, when their enemies besiege them in the land of their cities, whether plague or whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone, or by all your people Israel, when each one knows his own burden and his own grief, 
and spreads out his hands to this temple. Then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and give to everyone according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of the sons of men, that they may fear you to walk in your ways as long as they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. So in this magnificent structure that was in the land, he recognized heaven was where God dwelt. And he hoped that this place would be a tool of remembrance to return to God. And then God speaks the next chapter, and he gives this warning, verse 17. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walk, and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not fail to have a man as a ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. He continues in verse 21. And as for this house, which is exalted, Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done this to done thus to this land and this house? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore he has brought all this calamity on them. He backs off. And just like water coming in a leaky boat, the enemies of Israel have an upper hand. So, do they need God's help in dealing with Hamas's rockets? Right? Well, they do. About it. They do. Because if he doesn't, they've got problems. In mm-hmm. spite of all their great technology, they need, yeah. they need help. The belief in some places and some circles is that they don't need anyone's help. You know, they say to themselves and to the world, we, and I heard Netanyahu speaking, and he said, we have the ability to do this with no one's help. Mm. You know, and I think that's a very dangerous statement to make. Yeah. God kind of listens to what the leaders speak, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hopefully people are like falling on their faces, hey, no, Lord, we need <clears throat> yeah. All right. King Hezekiah, it's a little object lesson, a little lesson here. King Hezekiah was a great man, a great leader. He really purified the land. But he didn't have a heart for the next generation. He didn't disciple people to take his place. And so when, uh, didn't he have a son? When the prophet brought word to him that he was going to die, he turned his face to the wall and cried. Yeah. And the prophet went back, God's heard your cry, I'm giving you 14 more years? 14. Mm-hmm. All right. So, during those 14 years, he has a son. When he dies, this son is 14. He takes over the throne and undoes all his father's work. Um, during the kid's childhood, he showed the Babylonians the riches in the temple. The prophet came to pay him a call and said, you know what, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Now your enemies are going to come in and take over this place. Your children will be made captives. Did Hezekiah turn his face to the wall and weep and cry out to God like he did before when he was crying for his own sake? He said, good word, at least my years will be spent in peace. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah. He was a righteous king. He's the right guy. But we can all not think beyond our own lifetime. Where Everybody needs a two-generational vision, now and then the younger. My, my mm-hmm. generation. At least two. <laughs> yeah, and care for the older two. We're into three now. <laughs> yeah, we're into three. That's right. Okay. So Manasseh is 12 when his dad becomes king. And he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Verse 4, he also built altars in the house of the Lord 
of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. I mean, he was messing up big time. Also, he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He was a wild child. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I appointed for your fathers. Only if they are careful to do all I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. <clears throat> so Manasseh seduced Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And they were more evil than the people that had dispossessed the land. Now keep in mind, Solomon's son pulled the number, yeah. split the kingdom. Yeah. So this was Solomon's so this was Judah, the descendants of Solomon, this is Manasseh, doing this. I mean, this is bad. The Lord spoke to Manasseh, verse 10, and his people, but they would not listen. So he's given them mercy, man. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. There's the word to his dad fulfilled. Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God, got his attention, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. So somehow in his dealings with rebellious humanity, this is how God deals with us. Here's a promise to inherit. I bless you with it, but you're not faithful to me. You're not going to enjoy it. Till you come back to me. So he deals with us individually that way, but also corporately. Mm -hmm. This is why America really needs to consider its ways. Yeah. We've got enemies all around us too. <clears throat> And we've got leaders bragging about how we can, you know, fry people off the face of the earth. I would be careful, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's easy to look at what Israel did and say, man, oh, oh, unbelievable, look how they acted, look how they acted. And then I'm often reminded how I act, you know. Mm -hmm. How it's the same cycle. How, how, with me. And we're supposed how to I act and how spirit. our nation acts. <laughs> Yeah, it's our nature too, you know, the same yeah. thing. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we sacrifice our kids and we yep. do all that mm -hmm. crazy stuff, you know. Just, we're not any better than... Yeah. Oh, no. So, eventually they were carried off to Babylon for years. And during, uh, during the years of captivity, Nehemiah heard that Jerusalem was in ruins. He fasted and sought the favor of the king for whom he was a cupbearer, which meant he could be called upon to taste things that might be poison. He was a trusted mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. and uh, left that lot, that comfortable life um, to go back and rebuild the wall in record time. And it's part of God answering the prayers of his people who were tired of being scattered and wanted to go home. Nehemiah 9 talks about a prayer meeting. This is an amazing prayer we're going to read. Now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners. And they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God 
for one fourth of a day of the day. So either it was six hours or three hours or four hours. They stood and read. And for another fourth, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So they were in, you could say they were in church all day. They were. Well, and all day started at, all day. at sundown. Yeah. Their day starts at sundown. So. But it doesn't say were, when it started. They just, a the fourth of the day. One fourth of it. One yeah. fourth of the day. When was that? I don't know. Well, all right, I verse, guess it was probably verse seven. Sundown. <laughs> Would be my guess. You are the. It would have been a cooler if it was a hot time of day. <laughs> right. You are the Lord God. Here's the prayer. You are the Lord God who chose Abram, and brought him out of the Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites, the Termites, the Bed bug bites. <laughs> to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted proudly against them, so you made a name for yourself as it is this day. Verse 16, but they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. Verse 18, even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and worked great provocations. Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave them your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. At one point, God was so fed up, he told Moses, I'm going to send my angel with you guys. I'm kind of backing off here Moses said, if your presence doesn't come with us, we're not going. He interceded and God heard. Moreover, verse 22, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Sihon, pardon my mispronunciations, the land of the king of Heshbon, the land of Og, king of Bashan. You also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land which you had told their fathers to go in and possess. So the people went in and possessed the land. You subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they wished. And they took strong cities and a rich land, and possessed houses full of all goods, cisterns already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient, could be the children of the people, and rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself, and they were great provocations. Therefore you delivered them into the hand of their enemies who oppressed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven. And according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they again did evil before you. <laughs> Therefore you left them in the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried out to you, you heard from heaven and many times you delivered them according to your mercies and testified against them that you might bring them back to your law. Verse 31. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them. 
for you are God, gracious and merciful. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy, do not let all the trouble seem small before you that has come upon us. That's, that's, <laughs> you're so awesome, you may not understand the pain we're in. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what's a blessing about Jesus. He knows what trouble is. Yes, that's right. Not just by omniscience and superior intelligence, experience. but by experience. Right. He's a high priest that's able to empathize with our weaknesses. Mm-hmm. At this point in their covenant, they did not have this assurance. God, in all your greatness, please don't consider what we're going through a meager thing. Our kings and our princes, our priests and our prophets, our fathers, and on all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until this day. However, however, you are just in all that has befallen us. For you have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Neither our kings nor our princes, our priests nor our fathers have kept your law, nor heeded your commandments and your testimonies with which you testified against them. For they have not served you in their kingdom or in the many good things that you gave them or in the large and rich land which you set before them nor did they turn from their wicked works. Here we are, servants today and the land which you gave to your fathers to eat its fruit and its bounty. Here we are, servants in it. Lord, here we are, we're servants. We're humbling ourselves before you. You know, we've had trouble, but, you know, we deserved it, and now we're candidates for blessing. It's interesting that in verse 25 there, and they took the strong cities and rich land and possessed houses full of all goods, cisterns already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and delighted themselves in his goodness, but not in him. They were happy to have all the stuff, but they didn't delight in him. There's a lesson there, isn't there? I think that's what where the we're gifts, going wrong in this country. The mm-hmm. gifts become an idol to displace the giver. Yeah. Yeah, he wants to be good and give us these good things, but you know, when we receive them, it's when we lose those things. All of a sudden, oh God, where those things go? You know. And but when things then we look when, at him. When things happen like unexpected surgeries and yeah. <laughs> challenges, <laughs> man, we are Yeah. We're calibrated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's good. Yeah. Calibrated. We give him an hour on Sunday. <laughs> man, it's amazing. Yeah. One servant, one church up there north of the Metroplex was advertising 45 minute services. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Rodney Howard right? Brown says you got a one hour dry cleaners. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a good buddy <laughs> from <laughs> Temple. He, he used to always say, you know, it makes me feel good to go spend that hour there. What? It yeah. makes me feel good, is what he said. It's all about my feelings. It's all about his yeah. feelings, you know. Wow. Yeah. Delighting in the goodness, but yeah. not in him. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um Larry Lee wrote a book in the eighties, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? Bible mm-hmm. study attempting to motivate um, people to pray for an hour. A couple years ago we went to the National Cathedral. And uh, it's something to see. You ought to see it. Full, full, of, full of idolatry and mixture and stuff, but there is some cool stuff in it in D.C. Mm-hmm. We go in the bookstore. They've got Star Wars memorabilia, New Age books. But then I found a book by a well-known author. If I said his name, you guys would know. The book is, the book is on prayer, and the book is entitled, this is a picture of where we're at, The Power of a Half Hour. <laughs> it's a Bible study, you know. <laughs> Can you at least pray a half hour? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of like when, Mo, when oh, Abraham yeah. was talking to God. That's about right. The Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, whittling it down. Trying to deal. Trying to deal. Exactly. God stopped him, though, at 10. Yeah. He's like, don't go anymore. I'm nah, that's it. I yeah. used to tell, we used to tell our kids, Bob and I both, 
you know, we we talk about tithing in the church. But I used to tell the kids, what are, what are you, how much time are you giving God? Yeah. How much time are you giving God? Yeah. And I don't, maybe I don't do it every day. Many days I give you more time. But I told the kids, you know, we need to be tithing our time too. You can spend a couple of hours every day with God. You can mm-hmm. spend a couple of hours, you know, you need to spend some time reading that word. You need to spend some time. Uh, time talking to Lord. him. You need to spend some time witnessing to somebody, helping somebody. There's all kinds of ways we can give our time. But I'm a, <clears throat> I, I've been that way for years. I've been a real firm believer in the fact we need to tithe our time. That's the most important thing we have. Yeah, time, time is valuable. That's why in church services we don't need to be wasting time. Because it's valuable. It's important. Things clutter what people remember anyway. Um, just the opposite of I was talking to someone today about an employee and he's giving a hard time and I said let's pray right now that um, that he would get a job the Lord would bless him with a job I said you know, so I said Father God we just pray that he, he would bless him with a job right now and so uh we finished, we said the prayer, we talked a few minutes, uh, a little bit more, then you guys came in, and, uh, and then uh, all of a sudden, I get a call back, sister says, guess what chaplain, I said what, she said, Thomas just called me, oh, I said his name, Thomas just called me, he said he got a job. Oh, nice <laughs> God. Right. She goes, wow, the prayer worked out so fast. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And um, it's interesting too here, you know, we see Moses, you know, the, even the, the angel, he's like, hey, Satan, the Lord, you know, handle you. I'm not, I don't even got, you know, I'm not going to even go there. Let him handle you. Mm-hmm. And whew, takes off, you know. <laughs> mm. You know. Yeah. We could spend countless hours of praying. I know people who pray a lot. Uh, sometimes I don't hear no testimonies, you know. And then a small little prayer. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah. To me, it's about humbling ourselves and being faithful. Because mm-hmm. accum- time with God accumulates. I spend time faith. with Him today, yeah. time with Him tomorrow, that accumulates. Mm-hmm. But yeah. if it's one hour a week, man, and, and you know, it's not even that anymore. I know it. Oh, People God. are doing the monthly deal right. or the yeah. quarterly deal or the, they're he- headed down the road to Christmas and Easter. And we had a young family in the church that left because we didn't take sabbaticals as a church. Just shut it down for a month. People are burned out. Yeah, I said, okay, okay. I, I said, I said, people know when they're burned out, and when they are, they do take sabbaticals. We have people taking sabbaticals from church all the time. But what if they show up for church and we've shut things down? I said, that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. yeah, we went to a, a so-called seeker-safe church in Colorado, and if the sports team made the playoffs, they would shut church down. Mm. I'm not kidding. No, that, that didn't surprise me up there. Believe no, me. <laughs> that was heartburn for me. We would go yeah. around and around. Yeah. yeah they say our reasonable services. Reasonable yeah. service is a lot more than just, you know, a few minutes or even a couple hours. I mean, he expects us to walk continuously. The, yeah. yeah, the way he walks. Yeah, right. You know? he wants and a community with one follow another. Follow me. Yeah. Yeah. Follow me. me. Yeah. That doesn't mean he went to the synagogues for one hour a week. It's a community. He was 24-7, follow yeah. me. Yeah. And that's what he really wants us to do. That's good. Uh, yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, to keep the class at an hour, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I want to thank you for coming. I'm good for one more lesson, and then we're going to start watching videos and seeing these things coming to pass in our day. Cool. It's going to be very interesting. The next lesson is on the prophets and what they had to say okay. about the land, which obviously is a review of all this. Um, anyway, let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for 
uh, what you're doing in the earth and for the testimony that Israel is to the world. Help us, Lord, to learn lessons that we are to learn and apply in our own lives. Thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that we've been chewing on in, even in this room today. Bless everyone, I pray. Use us for your glory in Jesus' name.